mostly down to around 7 to 9 Celsius, a bit colder in the countryside. But a bright start for many, certainly much sunnier skies across a large part of England and Wales. And we keep the sunny spells and dry weather here into Thursday afternoon. Perhaps a thickening of the cloud in the north and northern England will see the odd spot of rain. But showers continuing for western Scotland and northern Ireland. And similar conditions on Friday with some rain or showers in the far north and northwest. Drier further south and then fine for all of us this weekend. Coming up on Dan Wilson tonight, as the outrageous disregard for vaccine damage victims is exposed, I'll speak to brave Scotsman Alex Mitchell, who developed blood clots so severe after the AstraZeneca jab he was forced to have his leg amputated. And do you believe Keir Starmer's claims that he didn't break the rules over Beargate? The Labour leader's biggest defenders do battle with me and top commentators, including Christine Hamilton. Is the Madeleine McCann case finally about to be solved after 15 years? Or have authorities got the wrong man? Detective turned investigative journalist Mark Williams Thomas reveals his findings from a private investigation into prime suspect Christian B. Plus, I'll be joined by my superstar panel, former Daily Star editor and current columnist Dawn Neeson, Sunday Mirror political editor Nigel Nelson, and political YouTuber Maya Tusi. That's Dan Wharton tonight, Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. on GB News. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubri, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debate, some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubri, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6 on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us. 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday, for To The Point on GB News. I'm Dan Wilson. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wilson tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Happy Tuesday to you. GB News on your television and on your radio. Feel free to mix and match. No, I didn't watch the Prince of Wales' speech. The absence of the Queen was too sad for me. But I did read the thing, and I'm chiefly interested in what's not said, what's said weekly, and what's said dishonestly. The Online Harms Bill, which is a census charter that will further suppress any dissenting views on climate fanaticism, immigration, lockdown, you name it. The Online Harms Bill is dishonestly represented as a fluffy bunny commitment to, quote, make the UK the safest place in the world to be online. Oh, that sounds so nice. Oh, look, I went to Google Net Zero and organic farming and it brought up a nice picture from the World Economic Forum of His Royal Highness and Saint Greta. Yes, rather than say an enraged Sri Lankan mob burning down the house of Minister Sanath Nishanta. Yes, 
Come home to a real fire. Become a Sri Lankan cabinet minister. Uh, because the government in Colombo made the mistake of actually doing what our net zero lunatic politicians only pay lip service to. I feel so much safer just seeing that picture of the prince and the saint, and I'm sure you do too. Why is a supposedly conservative government joining with the globalist left to enforce the big shut up. Natalie Winters will be here later to talk free speech. As for what's said weekly, how about this? Her Majesty's government will prioritize support for the Belfast Good Friday Agreement and its institutions, including through we're meant to take that as code for getting tough on the Northern Ireland Protocol. Yeah, right. We'll see what Peter Hitchens has to say about that. He's here in minutes. And what's not mentioned at all in the Queen's speech? The thousands upon thousands injured or indeed killed by the COVID vaccines. On that matter, the code of omerta. Silence seems to apply, but not here. We'll have more of that later in the show with Jules Serkin. Plus, the most important part, your take. Let me know what's got you riled up like a Sri Lankan torching a cabinet minister's house. Metaphorically, of course, I hasten to add. Email uh, me at gbviews at gbnews.uk or you can tweet me at gbnews. First, as always, the news with Polly Middlehurst. Mark, thank you. The top story is tonight. The leader of the Labour Party says the government isn't doing enough to address the cost of living crisis in the UK. MPs were debating the Queen's speech today in the chamber, which set out the government's legislative agenda. The Prime Minister says they're prioritising the cost of living, but says not everyone can be shielded from rising prices. Sir Keir Starmer says the Queen's speech was a thin address from a government that's out of touch. This government's failure to grow the economy over a decade, combined with its inertia in the face of spiralling bills, means that we are staring down the barrel of something we haven't seen in decades, a stagflation crisis. This Queen's speech takes those issues head on. Yeah. And above all, we're tackling the economic challenges with the best solution of all, and that's an ever-growing number of high-wage, high-skill yeah. jobs, yeah. Mr Speaker. Jobs, jobs, jobs. Well, it was Prince Charles today that delivered the Queen's speech at the state opening of Parliament. Her Majesty missing the traditional ceremony for the first time in almost 60 years. Buckingham Palace saying it was because of the Queen's episodic mobility issues. Sinn Féin's vice president says the Northern Ireland protocol is here to stay. Michelle O'Neill's comments come as the Democratic Unionist Party insists it won't join a new Stormont executive unless the post-Brexit trading arrangement is changed. Ms O'Neill spoke to Boris Johnson today, accusing him of being in cahoots with the DUP. I made it very clear to him that his pondering to the DUP and the dialing up of the rhetoric that we've heard again today, and I suspect we'll hear in the coming days, serves no purpose to provide the certainty and stability that the people here want to see. Well, in news away from home today, Ukrainian forces have recaptured villages from Russian troops north and northeast of Kharkiv. We understand eight settlements have been recovered as troops from the 92nd Separate Mechanised Brigade pressed a counter-offensive. And by pushing back Russian forces, Ukrainian troops are now moving into striking distance of Moscow's rear supply lines. Here, the Duke of Cambridge has given a personal tribute as he unveiled a memorial to those killed in the Manchester Arena bombing five years ago. He was accompanied by his wife, the Duchess of Cambridge, to the ceremony at the Glade of Light. 22 people were murdered by a suicide bomber after an Ariana Grande concert there. Prince William says it's important to remember those who were lost in the terror attack. As someone who lives with his own grief, I also know that what often matters most to the bereaved is that those we have lost are not forgotten. There is comfort in remembering, in acknowledging that, while taken horribly soon, they lived. They changed our lives. They were loved and they are loved. Prince William. On TV, online and on your radio via DAB+. You're with GB News this evening and now it's time for Mark Stein.
Thank you, Polly. Peter Hitchens is standing by. You won't want to miss that. In today's throne speech, the government boasted of the following. A £2.7 billion for the vaccine deployment program, £2.3 billion for the vaccine task force. But not a penny, apparently, for the thousands of people injured or killed by the vaccine, no matter what the coroner's certificate says. It all sounds so easy on the government website. Have you noticed your health declining? since receiving the COVID-19 injection. If you weren't made fully aware of the health risks from the COVID-19 vaccines, you are entitled to compensation of £120,000. Well, that sounds pretty straightforward. It's only when you prowl through the small print that you find out, quote, it can take at least six months to process a vaccine damage payment claim. If you're making a claim about a COVID-19 vaccination, it will take longer. Well, it's government. So it can take a lot longer. Charlotte Wright, who was on this show last week, Charlotte's husband died from the vaccine last January, 32 years old. That's almost a year and a half ago now, and she hasn't received tuppence three farthing from this program. They spent the marketing budget on a snazzy poster, and since then, as far as I can tell, they haven't paid out nothing. As I said yesterday, more than one thing can be true. On the one hand, Chairman Xi's Wu flu can kill people, and on the other hand, the vaccine can kill people. You can believe both things to be true. It's not either or. According to the yellow cards, over 2,000 people are dead. According to the government's website, quote, it is estimated that only 10% of serious reactions and between 2 and 4% of non-serious reactions are reported. So that would make over 20,000 deaths from the vaccine. Why aren't we talking about this? Over at... Um, What's it called? Talk radio? Talk radio? Mike Graham is fighting vainly the old ennui. Quote, pretty sad to see a project that had so much promise, that's GB News apparently, plumbing the depths of gaslighting the British people, all the way from hashtag Canada. Actually, is hashtag Canada a thing? I would be, I would be very surprised. I can't see that going viral. Uh, uh, if I remember, the Canadian Gaslighter is a minor superhero. Is he's, he's Wolverine's best friend in X Men 27? But you know, Mike Graham has a kind of point. It is faintly embarrassing that upstart colonials, Canucks like yours truly, or Kiwis like Dan Wooten, who will also be talking about this topic in the next hour, have to interview all these English, Scottish, Irish, Welsh widows and children. So why don't you guys on the home team give it a go, Mike? Our Canadian gaslighter, gaslight me one more time. Why don't you play that record on your show? Number 28 in 1973. And by the way, is it really gaslighting? Are you saying these wives aren't really widowed? These children aren't really the, these children aren't really orphaned? I've just just as I went on air, I saw this from the Manchester Evening News: tragedy as girl girl 18 dies of blood clot two weeks after COVID vaccine. This is Casey Turner here, 18-year-old Casey Turner. Uh, she had the vaccine uh, because she was part of a uh, Yorkshire health service team. So she wanted to have it so she didn't uh, infect uh, uh, other people or cause any trouble to other people. She had no reason to have that vaccine. 18 years old. Casey Turner. Poor girl's dead now. Manchester Evening News. Just before I came on air. I repeat what I said yesterday. We have asked AstraZeneca for a response. Every time we get one of these coroner's certificates from one of our guests, we forward it to AstraZeneca and ask them to comment on We have not heard back from them now, not for any of these people. Um, as we heard yesterday from Kelly Hatfield talking about her poor father, AstraZeneca sent legal teams to sit in on coroner's inquests up and down the land. So they're not short of manpower. 
Uh, we would be happy to have a spokesman for AstraZeneca tonight, tomorrow, any day of the week, but we haven't heard a peep from them. Uh, let me know your thoughts, gbviews at gbnews.uk. You can tweet me at gbnews. We'll have more on that in just a few minutes. But first, as I said earlier, I thought the passage in the Queen's speech about Northern Ireland was very weak and doesn't really seem to address the facts on the ground. Peter Hitchens in his Mail on Sunday column was withering about those facts and concluded that the IRA have won. Uh, and it is certainly absurd that Her Majesty's first minister in Northern Ireland will be from a party that has advocated for the violent overthrow of the British Crown. Uh, Peter Hitchens joins us now. Uh, you see this as basically the natural outcome of the Good Friday Agreement that was obvious when Tony Blair uh, uh, initiated it a quarter century back. Well, yes, I, I dislike the term of the Good Friday Agreement, which seems to me to give a sort of a religious uh, gloss to what was actually, a, let's call it the Belfast Agreement to be straightforward and mm. an, an unprejudiced, uh, an agreement which seems to me to be quite a sordid uh, surrender by a, a major uh, democratic law governed power to what was effectively uh, terrorist gangsterism. I, what, there's a sort of Pollyanna view of the agreement, which goes with calling it the Good Friday Agreement, that it brought peace to Northern Ireland. This is only very partly true, apart from the fact that only that the worst single atrocity of the whole period, the Omar bomb, took place after the agreement. There's been an awful lot of continuing horror going on in Northern Ireland, which is not reported in the rest of the United Kingdom, the, the, the intimidation of people out of their homes. Uh, protection racketeering crime. There are still very high walls dividing one part of Belfast from another because the sectarian tensions are extremely high. The thing has not been at all solved. And the problem remains, uh, as it has been in Northern Ireland for a very long time indeed, how you can actually get over the difficulty of making sure that one of the two communities doesn't ever get to lord it over the other. This is the disastrous situation in, in, uh, under many years of, of storm on rule. And we're, we're now facing the worrying position where it's quite possible that within, say, 20 years, the Sinn Féin government in Dublin, and this is another development people aren't paying much attention to, but Sinn Féin is rapidly becoming a yep. very important and powerful party in the Republic. The Sinn Féin government in Dublin, in control of a 32-county island, is actually coping with the, 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 the process and the discontents uh, of particularly of poor Protestants in Belfast. And how are they going to cope with it? And you, you once again have the problem, which has beset Ireland really since this problem got underway, of one side uh, being in charge of the other and, 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 the, and the minority complaining with, with reason that they've been mistreated. The whole problem in Northern Ireland going, going back, particularly to the outbreak of, of trouble in 1969, which I personally remember beginning, uh, was precisely that, that people in Northern Ireland were discontented with the way the, the, the Roman Catholic minority in Northern Ireland were discontented with the way in which they were treated. The gerrymandering of, of, of voting, the, 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 the poor access to housing, the poor access to jobs, the general discrimination, how did we got rid of? Uh, and and that, a lot of progress was being made towards that, I have to say, under direct rule. And then suddenly the British government switched to this policy of, uh, of the Irish dimension, of, of it being a matter of political control of Northern Ireland rather than of bettering the position of the minority. And that gave enormous, uh, enormous impetus uh, to Sinn Féin's campaign, which is basically for Irish unity rather than anything else. And this, this is backed and pursued you, very you much by the United States. So with, with, this is a vitally important part of it. The United States was pushing it. And I was in Washington, D.C. Oh, when that was going on. No, absolutely. Um, you've raised a lot of points there, and a particularly important one is that Sinn Féin is uh, the only party in these islands to operate on both sides of the border, and as you point out, is likely to be in control north and south. And I loathe the IRA as much as you do, but I don't think Sinn Féin are stupid, and they're opportunists, and it is, I think, undeniable that there has certainly been an implosion in unionist confidence about its identity. And I don't blame that entirely on Ulster loyalists. I think uh, the British government, by basically 
uh, creating a, a, a united Ireland on, on the trade front bears a large part of responsibility for that. Well, that's brought it back into focus for a lot of people. But the fact is that the 1998 agreement pretty much made it plain. John Major had made it plain in his great no selfish remaining interests statement of some years before. Oh, uh, yeah. Pretty much made it plain that the, 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 the people who call themselves loyalists in Northern Ireland increasingly find that the country to which they wish to be loyal doesn't want to have them. It doesn't want their loyalty. Uh, the, hmm. the British establishment has, has long wanted to get rid of Northern Ireland. It's expensive. Uh, it's complicated, it's difficult, and they face an awful lot of pressure from outside. I, I imagine strongly from the European Union. I know for certain from the United States uh, to, 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 to find some way of handing over. And I, what I find distressing about this is if you talk about it with any kind of frankness, immediately you enter into this uh, dreadful uh, sectarian uh, one side or the other football num United versus City football team stuff where because you don't like yeah. Sinn Féin, people assume you're a member of the Orange Order. I actually think that the, the <laughs> British government should have granted home rule to Ireland before 1914. I think the mishandling of, yes. of that and the, the terrible mishandling of the Easter Rising and the execution of the leaders, disastrous policies, which which, which no. very foolish. The, the, the neglects of Northern Ireland during the post-war period was also a great a great shame but i think the, the there have always been plenty of peaceful uh, law-abiding people in northern ireland who believe in irish nationalism who sought a peaceful path to some sort of sensible compromise and what this agreement did was it pushed them to one side it also pushed to one side the the, the peaceful and democratic unionists and gave much more of a voice to those who uh, how shall i put it uh, are not wholly separate from the, the the rougher strands of unionism. So it basically was a slap in the face for peaceful and constitutional parties. And that's what I really dislike about it, that it, it will lead, well, I think, it, I think it will eventually lead to the reunification of Ireland, but under very, very distressing circumstances in that it will be the first change of a border in Western Europe as a result of violence yep. since 1945. I don't think that's a, a, a big thing to put, on your, to put on your CV that you've done that. We really ought to have encouraged the, the constitutional and the lawful, not the unconstitutional and the lawless, but 1998 definitely gave a signal uh, to the, those who are prepared to support violence that it gets somewhere. And once you've done that, of course, you've, you've poisoned the whole of civil society. You've said violence will get you much further than constitutional yeah. action. Well, that has terrible long-term consequences. No. No, that's, uh, there's a lot of good sense in that. And if we could wind the clock back a century and 10 years or so, uh, we would give, have given uh, all Ireland home rule and there'd be a uh, John Redmond-led Irish Parliamentary Party government in Dublin. And a lot of this could have been uh, avoided. And you're quite right to excoriate John Major for saying that we have no, uh, you, oh, oh uh, the United Kingdom has no selfish interest in Northern Ireland. Well, does, uh, we hear that all the time. The royal family go to Jamaica and say we have no selfish interest in Jamaica uh, and uh, the rest of the Caribbean. I mean, do we have no selfish interest in England, Scotland and Wales? This is not so talk. Thank you very much, well, uh, Peter Hitchens. It was a great column and great to hear. Yeah, just quickly. No, no, it, it, it is, I'm afraid, a general tendency at the moment. And the, the, we're moving towards a major constitutional and national crisis, which, of course, when the fullness of time uh, comes around and we, we have a new monarch, uh, will be brought very much to a head. Yeah. I wish people would just think more constructively about it than, uh, and, and be, be prepared to accept that there have been serious mistakes made in the past few years, particularly over this. Yep, absolutely. Uh, and, well, and well said, Peter Hitchens. Appreciate you joining us, as always. We're going to get to your reaction next. Uh, GB Views at GBNews.uk. It's not just about uh, loyalists and Republicans in a small corner of the realm. It's about us in the broader sense, too. You can tweet me at GB News. Also coming up, a BBC presenter clobbered by the vaccine. We're not giving up on this story. Uh, no matter what uh, half these guys want us to do. We're coming straight back. Don't go anywhere.
Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6 on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything, from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us. 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday, for To The Point on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Let's get to your emails. A Twitter user, the Republican share of the vote. I, didn't, I never know why we can't give people's Twitter handles. They just would be Twitter user. But Twitter user says the Republican share of the vote was unchanged. Just more of their voters chose Sinn Féin. This is no threat to the union. Tom says it's more a question of the protocol being a threat to the UK and the DUP being out of touch. Well, setting the last half of that aside for the moment, the protocol is a threat to the UK. It's, it's a scar across down that, that border down the Irish Sea is a scar straight down the torso of the United Kingdom. And the weak language in the Queen's speech, it, it actually is pathetic, even when it's read out as dully and monotonously as it was by the Prince of Wales. But something, ha that, that protocol has to go. There's not going to be a United Kingdom with that border down the Irish Sea. You can't be united. Uh, another Twitter user says, maybe Ian Blackford should be apologising for Nicola Sturgeon aligning herself to Sinn Féin whose military arm murdered Lord Mountbatten. Well, that's right. Uh, they killed members of the royal family. But you know something? I was at uh, Hillsborough Castle with my daughter a couple of years back, uh, the site of British power in Northern Ireland, Hillsborough Castle. And at the end, the lady who'd been uh, showing us around the castle asked if we'd like to sign the visitor's book. And my daughter opened it to sign her name. She's just a little girl, didn't know anything about Irish history or anything, and she signed it under the names of Martin McGuinness and Jerry Adams, who had just visited Hillsborough Castle the day before. It's a bit late to start complaining that they murdered Lord Mountbatten uh, because we decided to overlook the fact that they kill members of the royal family. OK, uh, I mentioned last week the BBC presenter Lisa Shaw, who died from the COVID vaccine last year at the age of just 44 and has in death been pretty much memory hold by her BBC colleagues. She's not the only BBC presenter to be clobbered by the vaccine. Fortunately, Jules Serkin is still with us, although in great pain. You can hear Jules on the BBC in Kent. She has a great show, Scoff and Quaff. 
about vittles and libations. I, I listened to one of Jules's Christmas shows last night and enjoyed it immensely. And in happier times, I'd go quaffing with her. But when it comes to victims of the vaccine, an extraordinary number of people seem to prefer scoffing at her and her situation. Uh, Jules Serkin joins me now. Before anything else, Jules, how are you actually feeling? Because uh, I think you had plans to go away for the weekend and you basically had to cancel them because you, you, you just weren't strong enough to go away. That's right, Mark. Hello. Um, it, yeah, I, uh, mm. these fax attacks just come and there's no warning. Um, I'm beginning to realise that, um, you know, I've set up a small support group of fax damage people mm. and uh, we're beginning to see a pattern now where these fax attacks, you get a day of fatigue, which you might not notice and you carry on. Um, mm. And then in my case, uh, the pains start jabbing in the left eye. As you know, I've been having lots of eye problems, uh, eye droop, facial numbness. Um, and we'd got a lovely mm. hotel booked. It was a family uh, bar mitzvah weekend. My husband's Jewish. Uh, he's a nice Jewish boy. And uh, we had this amazing weekend <laughs> booked. <laughs> and I sat down on the stairs uh, on Friday morning having packed. And he said, you look like, you know, you look awful. And I said, I can't come, you know, and it was just a big deal because I'm a bit of a, um, a live wire and I love a, I love a party uh, pre AstraZeneca. And have you actually filled in one of these yellow cards and applied for the government, the government's 120,000 pounds and all, all that kind of thing? Or, or are you just on the long list of people who haven't heard back from that? Uh, I filled in the yellow card in around April. I had, I had the jab on March the 5th. Uh, I've been ill ever since from mm. that night, that very night. Um, I now, also... just is, the, is this March 2021 or is it March 2021? Yeah, well, a year and a half ago. OK. So I then... Uh, also... And you filled in the yellow... I filled in the yellow card and then I also filled in the AstraZeneca form as well. Uh, and that's really frustrating mm. because you just get these uh, ridiculous emails back that are on some really old fashioned format that uh, you can't even read mm. it on your phone. You have to go up to a computer. Um, and also my GP uh, filled in a form to AstraZeneca uh, stating the long, long list of symptoms, the nerve damage and all the awful symptoms that I've had, life changing. Um, and she sent it last September the 21st. Um, and she's only had a, an auto reply. She's never had a response. I've also phoned AstraZeneca twice, Mark, and uh, they, each phone call was frustrating and they said different things that, that weren't what they'd said in the first phone call. And on the second phone call, I just put down the phone in tears because it was just so frustrating. They don't care. So your life has... No, no, I don't think there's any doubt. We, as I said, we've been trying to get AstraZeneca a reaction from them to the cases we've been talking about now since last Thursday. They haven't replied. They don't want to put anybody on the show. Are you a bit disturbed by the media coverage? I mean, I don't wish to knock your employer, but I was listening to the BBC earlier today. And in fact, if you if you listen to the BBC, it's basically like it's still March 2020 there's no the story hasn't moved on there's no idea that you know it isn't uh, the story is the covid's a threat and the vaccines should be for everyone including this 18 year old girl who just died in manchester so are you slightly disappointed at the media's one-sided coverage of this i am and uh, i sometimes scream at jeremy vine on his bbc show uh, when i'm driving uh, the radio show not the tv mm. one because he's just so pro-vax and I've certainly heard presenters shutting up um, people that are on the show when they're just giving another side, uh, our side basically. Um, and uh, my local paper did a story, I used to write a business column for them, so the Whitstable Times, they wrote a story from my tweets mm. and the mm. young journalist, that was last May 21, the young journalist mm. said, keep us informed, and they've never written anything else. So I think there's been 
you know, I think that these the media have been told to be quiet. I think it must be that. They don't want to hear another side. People are dropping like flies. I've got groups of people. I get messages most days, DMs. Um, I, and all of our symptoms are so similar. It's, it's like a nerve damage. Mm. Uh, you know, as you know, we've got people bedridden five, six months. Um, uh, as you know, mm. Alex Mitchell, who you're interviewing later with Dan Wooten, he's had his leg amputated. The, it's an endless list. Mm. And even in my everyday life, if I'm having my nails done or something, the young girl there had Pfizer and she hasn't had her period since last summer. She gets migraines, which she never had, right. and she's ill. She's I've seen her just go downhill from these two Pfizers. And I'm frustrated. I, well, I really am frustrated. Well, that's very, that's very interesting to me because the pushback from the groupthink media is always, well, these are all anecdotes. I would love to see the numbers, but in fact, for what seem to be political reasons, the Office for National Statistics and other people don't actually seem interested in finding out the numbers. So you just pick it up bit by bit when you're with your hairdresser or whatever. Yeah, word of mouth. Um, and uh, I have a colleague who went completely deaf after the second AstraZeneca. I sent him the yellow card link and I texted him later, did you, did you do it? No, it was nerve damage to the brain. That's what his doctors told him. He now has a hearing aid. Um, but he never reported it. So many people don't report it or don't know how to even. If you think back to last year, mm. we weren't given uh, on the back of that little scruffy card that I still carry around. There's nothing on there about reporting. I do believe now they've added the yellow card link, but uh, many, many right. people don't report. And, and what's upset tell me, me is... Tell me, tell What's upset me, Mark? No, just tell... Te What's upset me is the batch numbers that crop up time and time again, and I've started making a list. So my batch, yeah. EV6671, uh, that was spread all around the country. So from Wales to Scotland to the Channel Islands, I'm in Kent, it went everywhere. And we all have really, really similar uh, symptoms, as I said, almost to a pattern. And two people we found, sadly, on Twitter that died from, from my batch, PV46671. I'd love to put that batch number yes. on the front of the Daily Mail and say, did you have this batch? No, absolutely. There's a story in America about a lab that was uh, supposedly producing deficient vaccine batches, and it is important that. But you're, you're a young woman, Jules. You have you had actually no, you're a healthy young woman, you had no need to take this vaccine in the first place. Do you feel bitter uh, about the government essentially ballyhooing this thing as a one-size-fits-all treatment for everybody on the planet? I was just saying to the cab driver on my way in that um, the bombardment we had right back, if you go back to last year, uh, the constant news media, which we don't get now, um, you know, don't hug your mm. gran, uh, don't touch this, don't touch that, don't sit on a bench, don't have a coffee with a friend. It was relentless every mm. day and we were all terrified. Uh, certainly I thought I was going to end up on a, you know, on a ventilator face down, um, dying in some mm. hospital. So that was the propaganda. I feel I was coerced. Um, I've had COVID just a few weeks back and my husband, who's double jabbed, had his AstraZeneca the next day. We got it on exactly the same day. We had more or less the same symptoms. I would say I probably had a bit more energy than he did. Um, and he's double jabbed, I'm one jab. There was no difference really in our symptoms. So I don't think, I don't call it a vaccine. I can't call it a vaccine. That's, that's completely correct. We're just a few weeks away from uh, you know, the government of Austria, for example, uh, saying that if you don't get vaccinated, you're going to be fined. If you don't pay the fine, you're going to go to prison. Uh, a, a lot of countries, uh, the, gov the government of Canada is, is still saying you can't get on an internal train uh, or an internal flight if you don't uh, have this vaccine. So we have a, the, a situation that I don't think has ever existed in the in in history before where governments are making free peoples get vaccinated for entirely non-medical reasons 
Yep, it's, uh, there's a discrimination happening and you find it and it's, there's a division between people who've been vaccinated. I know young girls who work in the beauty industry, for example, um, who don't tell their clients that they haven't had the booster. Uh, there's this whole discrimination, who's had it and who's not. I also know a company that's written to all their clients saying, when you come in, please don't ask our staff of, uh, about their health, you know, uh, whether they've been jabbed or not which I think is brilliant, you know, we shouldn't be asking people mm. if they have um, and people shouldn't have to be lying. But hasn't Denmark stopped uh, the vaccination programme? Yep. And didn't uh, yep, Dr. They, Denmark... Dr Anthony Hinton, uh, yeah, Denmark, who I follow so. on Twitter, he put that uh, BBC story out and Twitter censored him. And that's what I'm seeing all the time, a lot of mm. censorship. And uh, same on Facebook. If I put a, a true story on Facebook, I get that header and footer find out about the vaccines. And it's, mm. it's, it, there is definitely censorship going on. And people need to be informed. Had I known back in March 21, A, that it had chimpanzee uh, cold serum in it or whatever it was, adenovirus, I would have thought twice. Um, and also mm. with human embryo, I believe. But we weren't told. Yeah. I mean, that's spooky, no. isn't it? We weren't Why told do you, at all. I think, I think there's something going on. They, they, they can't... They're worried about acknowledging what's happened to you, the government. And I don't think they want to do it because I think they're worried that if they start giving these £120,000 payouts to people for the vaccine, there'll just be no end to it. But it clearly is that we can't, you know, we can't get uh, the health secretary on the show to talk about this issue. Why do you think the politicians are just stonewalling you and the widows and the orphans that we've been talking to previously? I think it is about money, but what did they spend on furlough? What did they spend on track and trace? What did they spend on, you mm. know, uh, the PPP, the, the, the equipment that's just languishing somewhere because it wasn't fit for purpose or now it's not being used. I think it must be a money mm. thing or is it guilt? Well, I think that's very interesting. I think it could well be guilt. I think it would mean admitting that the last two years had been a disastrous mistake. But if you listen to Sajid Jack, we've, as I said, we've just had an 18 year old girl killed, uh, unnes took, the, took the vaccine unnecessarily in Manchester, she's now dead. Sajid Javid still wants to stick it in the arms of your 18-year-olds, your 12-year-olds, your 9-year-olds and your 4-year-olds. Mm. Uh, why haven't they at least backed off the universal uh, prescription of the thing? Well, this is what I've been saying. I mean, you know, we have lots of conversations like this, Mark, and um, I say to my friends, OK, I don't understand what's going on. If UK does this sort of thing, why is Canada doing it? Why is America doing it? Why is Australia doing it? Why? But is it just a case of these politicians just doing what they're told and following like sheep what they're told? Some, some mm. law, some agenda, some rule. Um, but they have to mm. now admit they can't keep killing people. They cannot keep young people. It's, it's really distressing. No. That's a terrible thing to hear you say, Jules. Uh, they can't keep killing people. And by they, Jules means uh, the government and the public health bureaucracy. Mm. The fact is, we all know whatever the merits of the vaccines, they wear, they're rubbish anyway. By the time you get to the fourth jab, it wears off. They've just had this Israeli study published in Nature that the fourth jab wears off completely after a couple of months. So you're going to get six of these shots a year according to this study, to, to, to not ward off the COVID. Meanwhile, you're going to be killing thousands and thousands of fit, young, healthy people who never needed. Uh, Jules, you said it had affected you and given you a bit of droopy eye. And I think we've got the picture of you with your eye working properly and then uh, the droopy eyed look. Can we put that up on the screen? I think, I think we got that here somewhere. Yeah, look at, look at that. It's, it's and, and as far as we know, until they invent the next miracle cure over at AstraZeneca or Pfizer or wherever, you're stuck with a lot of this uh, for the rest of your life. As I said, I'm, I'm astonished at how you put up with this. 
Uh, I listened to all that good chair in your Christmas show, and uh, and and I'm glad you can find that because because what what has been done to you is terrible, and we need to talk about this. And uh, if, if you follow Jules on Twitter, you'll know she's got together with other victims of this. The victims, by the way, Mike, Mike Graham says it's gaslighting. You guys don't exist. And that's why the British media refuse to talk about you. But Jules exists, and what happened to her should not happen to more people. And Sajid Javid still wants to jab everyone. Get your fourth shot, get your fifth shot, jab your kids. No, healthy people do not need to get something, uh, do not need to get this shot. Thank you very much for joining us, Jules. Uh, Jules is from uh, BBC Kent, and you can hear her on the radio in that part of the world, and you should listen to her, uh, because the, the, the scoffing and quaffing is what you'd be talking about if... Uh, the, if the yes. vaccine hadn't done this to you. And yes. I, know, I know what that's like. You had a great life, you had a great show, and that's what you want to talk about. And, and God bless you for talking about this instead. Uh, Jules, thank you very much, and we hope Thanks, you'll come Mark. back and talk about this some more. Thank you. Um, coming up, ask me anything you'd like in Stump the Stein, or ask me some more about this. I'm disgusted by the reaction of some of these alleged UK media legends, completely disgusted. Oh, and if you think the big tech censors are bad, now they're being deputized as state censors. We'll talk about that up next. We have our friend Natalie Winters. Lots more straight ahead. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubri, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubri, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6 on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday, for To The Point on GB News. I'm Dan Wilson. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wilson tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Right at the top of the show, I mentioned this government's appalling online harms bill. It's incredible this has been done under a conservative government. Um, but already, it hasn't even passed yet, and the regulators, by which I mean Ofcom, they're investigating me, but now they'll get to investigate you too, because they're being given more powers. Uh, and they're already hiring <laughs> Facebook commissars to police the internet. So you know they're not going to do it. If, if they didn't, if they wanted to signal, oh, we're going to have a light touch and all the rest, they wouldn't hire the Facebook control freak. Again, as I mentioned yesterday, we'd like Michael Grade, whatever he's called now, Lord, Lord, Lord Grade of whatever, to come on this show and uh, talk about this um, because this is not something that should be done. It's going to make things worse. Uh, now, as you know, uh, the other week, a saviour came along. 
who looked like he might reverse this myline trend, but perhaps not. Uh, Natalie Winters from the National Pulse is uh, back with us. And Natalie, it turns out that uh, he hasn't actually bought Twitter, Elon Musk. He's trying to get together the cash to buy Twitter. Uh, and a lot of that cash is coming from some dodgy sources. Yeah, I think the best approach to this is just proceeding with caution. So we looked in at the National Pulse to a lot of the investors who are bankrolling Elon Musk's purchase of Twitter, um, specifically what are known as equity investors. So these are companies in some cases putting up over half a billion dollars uh, into Twitter. Uh, and, and really concerningly, especially a platform that should be defending free speech, that's a value that Elon Musk has at least purported to, to defend and protect, um, there are at least two two entities in there that have given, again, hundreds of millions of dollars that have very, very deep ties to the Chinese Communist Party. Um, one of them is a company known as Binance. Um, this is a China-based kind of cryptocurrency, uh, Bitcoin mining firm. But we've done a lot of digging into this company. They're partnered with some state-owned enterprises in China. They're also part of what's known as the Belt and Road Initiative, which is the way that China expands oh, yeah. its power globally. Yeah, very, very mm. concerning that they're associated with that. Another firm mm. known as Sequoia Capital. They have a China branch. Um, they're very, very deeply in, in business, um, not just with the Chinese Communist Party, but a lot of their higher ups have actually advised the Chinese Communist Party. So I think it's just important to take all that into consideration when we're kind of adjudicating uh, what a, a you know post Musk or, or post Jack Dorsey, post uh, Parag Agarwal Twitter will look like because you know you always got to follow the money. And in this case, it seems that some of the roads lead back to the Chinese Communist Party. Now, the Chinese have bought up just about everything around the planet that they need to buy up there. They've, they've got their claws into all kinds of elite Western universities and all kinds. This is before their pure business interests. But they don't really have pure business interests, do they? Because when they do something like this, uh, they generally do it to advance Chairman Xi's long-term strategic goals. There's no real private business in China, is there? No, not at all. This is this is all by design. Um, I think something that a lot of people don't know about, it's, it's Article 7 of China's national intelligence law, and it stipulates that any company, even if it's not explicitly state-owned, can effectively be requisitioned by Beijing, um, by the Chinese Communist Party, to serve the ends of the state, whether this takes the form of sharing user data, um, sharing client data, or even actually using businesses to further the aim and agenda um, of China. China. So that's something that always needs to be kind of taken into consideration when we're talking about Chinese companies, because even if it's not a state-owned enterprise, all Chinese companies are basically dormant state-owned enterprises just waiting for Xi Jinping to kind of give the sign to, to flip that switch mm. on um, and have these companies really work to serve the ends of the Chinese Communist Party. But it also just is the, the broader economic system over there. Um, you know, there, there are, are not no strings attached, uh, to, to put it one way, when it comes to Chinese Communist Party investment. They get a very, very high return on investment. Um, and a lot of times it come, comes in the form of influence. I think probably the best example of this is, say, academia. Uh, we saw the Chinese Communist Party pouring tons and tons and tons of money into not just higher uh, level institutions, but even primary schools all the way down to you know the kindergarten level um, and in return you know you kind of start seeing the curriculum change what they're teaching these kids definitely no mentions of touchy subjects like Taiwan or Tiananmen Square I mean I think it just represents the dangers that come with Chinese Communist Party investment um, it's not altruistic it's not to bail out these you know institutions that are that are in need of financial stress because of the, the pandemic that China caused in the first place. Mm. Um, but there's always an agenda um, behind the investment. Do you think uh, Elon Musk knows this? Because if he does, it's quite clear, for example, that the Chinese will be saying to him, oh, whoa, 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 look, they keep saying we caused the Wuhan China virus to go everywhere. You ought to put a health. We might just be swapping one set of health warnings for another not so very different set of health warnings on tweets. Yeah, it's very unlikely that the Chinese Communist Party and their kind of uh, de facto assets wouldn't want, you know, just uh, nothing in exchange for their nearly 
billion dollars mm. in equity that they're pouring into this Twitter purchase. Um, you know, and I think mm. that's the the unfortunate thing about Elon Musk. You know, he's been hailed as a savior, and to some extent, the situation at Twitter is so bad. Uh, we really need anyone to help take the platform over and restore it to what it should have been. Um, but Elon Musk is is someone who has said very nice things about the Chinese Communist Party. He's someone who has done business with the Chinese Communist Party and continues to open factories over there. Um, and he's even attended conferences that have been sponsored by various state-owned entities with links to broader kind of espionage fronts, all administered by the Chinese Communist Party. So again, the situation is so dire that we do need someone, right, to, to bring Twitter back to, to, you know, reinstate President Trump's account. Um, but I think we just mm. have to have a very, very <laughs> watchful eye and make sure uh, that we don't see a continuation of Twitter's policies when it comes to issues that are more sensitive to the Chinese Communist Party, whether it's the origins of COVID-19 um, or who knows, you know, and any day it seems there's an issue that the Chinese mm. Communist Party always has a steadfast line that they're trying to push. Yeah, I, I certainly hope conservatives haven't been suckered again, which happens uh, quite a lot in the United States, because if the, if, the, if the net result of this is that one of the world's biggest social media platforms actually becomes indirectly, falls indirectly under the control of the Chinese Communist Party, that is not a good thing. So I hope uh, Elon Musk is being straight with us. And thank you as always, Natalie, because you dig deeper into this stuff than, uh, than anybody else does. Uh, go, go and read Natalie's piece over in the National Pulse. And, uh, and we thank you again for uh, spelling that out to us. It's, it's not a question, we're not children. It's not a question of cheerleading for the good guy and the bad guy. Some of these fellows, when you're that rich, the good guy, bad guy thing can be a whole lot more nuanced. And that's the, uh, that's the lesson there. Thank you very much, Natalie. Great to see you as always. Let's close things out with some ceremonial state opening of stumping. Can we have uh, Black Rod and the Lord Chancellor walking backwards with the cap of maintenance? I want it. Oh, wait. Oh, no. The budget couldn't run to a Lord Chancellor walking backwards with the cap of maintenance. What kind of operation is it? OK, here we go. Twitter user says, Several communities up north currently have their train service suspended until December. What are you complaining about? That's only seven months. What part of, is it actually, it's eight months. Uh, what part of leveling up would you call this? It's leveling down. Pay no attention to this leveling up. The lesson of the last two years is we're all being leveled down permanently. Daryl says, following the Queen's speech today and Her Majesty's age, uh, slowing her down now. Do you think Charles will be made regent? Wash your mouth out with soap, uh, Daryl. What a filthy thing to say. I don't want him as regent. You know, I think, uh, according to the Statute of Westminster, 1931, all the Queen's realms are equal. And so if the Queen is not uh, feeling like giving the throne speech in Parliament, maybe she should have a Governor General for the United Kingdom, as she does for Australia, Canada and New Zealand. I would far prefer that. Uh, and Belize and the Bahamas and Papua New Guinea and Tuvalu and uh, the Solomon Islands and Jamaica. And uh, I could go on. Uh, but the point is, but the point is, I would far rather have a governor general for the United Kingdom than the Prince of Wales as regent. Um, Herbie says, hi, Mark, what's your thoughts on the World Health Organization trying to take over the power of all 192 countries' power in the event of another pandemic? The World Health Organization is basically what we were talking about with Natalie, except the difference is you pay for it and the Chinese run it. Dr. Tedros is China's man. And, uh, and so we don't, we don't want any more of that. We don't want to be part of any treaty. The WHO bungled this thing right from the beginning. Uh, Break up the echo, says Dean Martin, Tony Bennett or Nat King Cole. Oh, no, no contest there. Break up the echo. It's got to be uh, Nat King Cole. Unforgettable. That's what I'm not. OK, that is uh, going to do it for me. Our ratings champ. 
This guy, have you seen this guy's ratings? He is the king of telly news in these islands. Dan Wooten, Unbel unbelievable, unbelievable numbers. And uh, you know why? Because he, he's like, he's the other colonial at this outfit, talking about the things that uh, people don't, other fellas don't want to hear about. You're actually continuing with uh, some of this COVID vaccine injury stuff, Dan. That's right, Mark. I heard your uh, monologue earlier. Thank you for the shout out. I have to be honest, though, Mark, after four years or whatever it is of Jacinda Ardern, I cling on to my British citizenship because I don't want what she's offering. But yes, tonight, really important interview, Mark, continuing a lot of what you've done. Alex Mitchell is with us. He's an incredible man, actually. Fit and healthy, uh, 57 years old, scaffolder in Scotland has the AstraZeneca jab 12 days later as a direct result. Uh, his left leg was amputated. And the scandal, Mark, is that at, up until this point, no offer of compensation whatsoever, really hitting all brick mm. walls with AstraZeneca. And I just think mm. that's a real scandal. No, you're ab absolutely right about that. And Dan will have that and a lot more coming up after the weather. Stay safe, stay free. Hello, I'm Ada McGiven from the Met Office. Showers will continue across northern parts of the UK during the next 24 hours, with more prolonged rain appearing across some parts of the south, although likely to avoid much of the far southeast. Low pressure in charge during the next couple of days. That's situated to the 